Okay, so as I said, um, today we're going to be covering uh, the advanced exercises, chapter 10, and we're going to start with if-else. And if-else takes really three arguments, test, yes, and no. Um, and test represents really the vector or the condition that will be evaluated. Um, yes, obviously, is the return value if the test is true, and no is the return value if the test is false. So again, you could test for something like, is age greater than five? And then if it is greater than five, you would do whatever yes is. And if it's not, you would do whatever no is. So let's take an example. Um, let's say that we generate a vector of arguments, and we'll call it A. Let's say we generate a, a vector A of a well, number of, number of, of uh, values, one through seven, some negatives in there. And we say, let's take the square root of A. What's going to happen? Well, in those cases where you have negative numbers, you're going to get not a number is going to be produced. You're going to get a result. You're going to get a warning message. Now, let's say that, that we were aware that um, this was going to come about and we really didn't want to see um, warnings and we really only wanted to uh, test values when they were positive. So let's put our vector back up here. So this is what we might do if we just wanted to do square root of a. Now let's, let's take a look at if else and how that might help us in, using, in, in doing this square root calculation and getting out some values, one, that don't have warnings, and two, that we can control what value is produced when, um, when you reach a negative number. So you could do something like this, square root if else. So now we've got to set up our test condition and we can say a greater than zero. So if a is greater than zero, we're going to give it back, we're going to report back a, or else we're going to pass an, an, an a, a uh, missing value in there. Now, if we run this, what we now see is we see the same result for all the square root values, but, instead, but now we also have spit back out to the screen, uh, first of all, no warning messages, and Second of all, we, have, we are able to control what value gets output. So now we put an NA in there. Um, and so now we can do something very nice if we wanted to later on. We can filter out on NAs and, and do something with our results. But basically, um, it allows us to do conditional execution in this case of, of the square root command. Um, one, of the thing, one of the places, though, that we often use it, though, is to kind of string together... Um, nested, say, arguments to maybe create a new variable. So for example, let's say that, uh, let's say that we wanted to create a variable of age bins. So for example, let's say I have ages that go from, I don't know, uh, 40 to 100 or 18 to 45, and I want to create bins of age. So I want to say, you know, group maybe eight, group maybe 18 to 20 together and group maybe 20 to 25 and 30 to 40 and just some age bins. You can wrap together a bunch of if else, if else nested arguments to do that. So let me, first of all, let's generate a quick data frame here so we have it. We could do something like this. So we're gonna go ahead and generate a data frame called T age. And what we did here in this data frame really, we're just we're just we're just grabbing, we're just generating um, random uniform ages from 18 to 45, 100 of them, weights from 40 to 100, 100 of them, and then we're grabbing some values for males and females, and then arbitrarily creating some serum creatinins. Um, nothing, nothing magical here. What I really wanted to get at was so I had a data frame here now called T age that has a range of uh, weights and ages and serum creatinins in it. They may not be related in any way, shape or form. They were just generated randomly. Um, what I did do though, is I set a seed. So if I run this again, I'll always get the same values back. So imagine that we want to generate bins of age. So we could, again, stack together a bunch of if else statements, such as the following. We could do something like this. OK, 
get a nicer look of that, a nicer view of that there. Let's, here we go. So now what we've done is we're going to string together a bunch of if else statements. So we're going to create a new variable called bin, which are um, bins of age. So now I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to conditionally set this bin variable to be one, two, three, or four, depending upon what condition it falls. So for example, if age is less than 20, bin will be one. And then of the ages re remaining, if age is greater than 20 but less than 30, it'll be two. If age is greater than 30 and less than 40, it'll be three. And then for anything that's greater than 40, you'll see an a, a bin of four. And so let's go ahead and run that and I can demonstrate to you that how that works. Now we could do something like head, take a quick look at the first couple of these. So let me just make this a little bigger so you can see it here. So what we've done now is what you can do is you can look here and say, okay, well, age is less than 20. We have a, a bin of one. For, less, for greater than 20 but less than 30, the bin is two. For those situations where it's greater than 40, the bin is four. And then between 30 and 40, the bin number is three. You know, what you set those bins at, depending upon what you want to do with it. But this, will, this would be a nice way then of, let's say you wanted to take a continuous variable and kind of plot it, you know, over certain age bins. This would give you a way then of, of generating a plot that groups these, um, these together by some predefined um, binning. So that's a very nice way of, of, of doing it. One might say, well, I could probably do this by just setting up these arguments rather than using all these wrapped if else statements. Maybe I can just do it with some, with the, with the uh, subset operator. So with something like this, with, you know, with the open bracket, close bracket approach. Maybe I can set up some bins that way. And so one might think you could do something like the following. And so now we say, okay, for um, let's create a variable and call it bin number two. And we're going to say for age less than 20, make it one. For age less than 30, make it two. For age less than 40, it'll be three. So let's see what ends up happening there if we do something like this. In some cases, it works fairly well um, because we've defined all the... Um, presets of binning that we wanted. Um, but actually, uh, this approach to kind of arranging bins, there's, there's probably ways you could get it to work by maybe presetting that bin number two to some value, but it gets kind of, it gets kind of tricky to get these, uh, use these subset arguments to set this binning up appropriately. So it's just a nice, it's nice to be able to do it um, with these if then else statements. And, and I think I'll show you later on how maybe if you want to set up something like uh, crack and clearance categories, how you might do it. In fact, I think that's the very next example. Um, let's say that we, we want to calculate creatinine clearance, okay? And we know that creatinine clearance typically takes as values age, weight, sex, and serum creatinine. And so that formula differ slightly based upon whether it's a male or a female. So let me just pull up here so I can share the formula. So here we have the formula for creatinine clearance on the screen. It's a function of age, weight, serum creatinine, and then there's a multiplier if it's a female or not. So what we could do is we can set up a very nice um, if then else statement to do that calculation for us. I should say if else, not if then else if else, to do that calculation for us. So first what we'll do is we can go ahead and write a function. And I've taken the advantage of doing that already. 
So let's say that we've wrote a function to calculate creatinine clearance. So here's our function. The function is going to take, the function is called CRCLX, and it takes as arguments age, weight, and serum creatinine. And then here's the familiar creatinine clearance calculation. Now what we don't see in here is any kind of uh, if any difference there, that sex isn't, isn't in this. Now you, you could, you could, one could argue that you could easily write sex in here as well. You could have written it in here as well, but for my demonstration purposes today, we're not gonna write sex into this equation. We're gonna use an if else statement to do that. So let's submit our function. So now we have, uh, we could do args on our function and we can see the function takes age, weight, and serum creatinine. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna calculate creatinine clearance in our, in our age, our, our data frame that we have, and I'm gonna condition that, or that, that conditional calculation is gonna be based upon the sex variable. So I, I defined above that males were one and, and females were zero in this case. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, it's gonna test for sex in our data frame, and let's just do a quick head of that data frame. It's gonna test for sex. If sex is one, it's gonna go ahead and use the typical creatinine clearance equation, the function that we supplied. If sex is not one, which basically it's zero or one, it's gonna go ahead and multiply that result by 0.85. So if we run this, now what we see is we have a new column called creatinine clearance that's calculated conditional on, uh, let's see if I can get a little bit more in here to get, um, yeah, I don't have that, the males are all at the end, but basically it's calculated conditional on whether or not sex is zero or one. So again, just another kind of way that we could use, uh, we could combine together kind of the if else function along with the function we've written to conditionally calculate some, some to, to apply some um, calculation on a conditional basis. As I said, you could have very easily written sex into this function as well and, and done that up here, then you wouldn't have had to use if else down here. However, um, in the demonstration of that today, I wanted to do that. Now, one thing we have to keep in mind, uh, there's in addition to the if else function, this function, if else, there are also, there's also a function called if and a function called else. And in this case, they're not, they're not true functions in the manner we've, that we've been describing. Um, they're really ways to control flow. So what I mean is they're control flow constructs of R. Um, and I believe that Tim went over some of these uh, in chapter nine of how you might use if and else. Um, um, one obvious difference that you want to be careful of or, or be aware of is that um, if tests uh, it expects really a simple length one logical vector. So in other words, it expects a test to be run against a length of one vector. So it's going to test just one row. Um, whereas if else can read and act on a vector of any length. As we showed here, um, it acted, if else acted across that whole um, vector, that whole data frame of TH. Um, what you need to be aware of really is that if you apply, say, if you do something like say, if, uh, let's say T age, dollar sign age, greater than 30, and you say, um, NA, something like that. Um, You'll actually get a result, um, but it's going to tell you, it's going to pass you a warning message that says the condition has length greater than one and only the first element will be used. So basically it's going to evaluate whatever's after the if statement only on the first row of this, uh, this vector, only on the first row of this vector. So this very first age, you know, and if you're doing this, you know, just at a command line, it's very easy. You'll pick up this error message right away. But you know, if you have maybe this test buried in some um, another set of functions somewhere in your R code, you may not catch this warning message. It may, it may be missed or it may be hidden in the background somewhere and you may not see it. 
So it's just really, really important to remember that there's that if else, the function and the, the individual functions if and else are different. And you can always um, do a question mark to find out what's wrong or what the, what the help information is you want to get. Or like I said, if you see this particular message out to your screen as far as a warning message, you don't expect it, you'll, you'll know that, uh, that you've used the wrong function, likely that you've used the wrong function. And I do it on a frequent basis and I just have to then go back and remind myself that you know I need to use if else when I want to do conditional testing across a whole vector of objects. Okay, um, we're going to come back and uh, I think the next thing is slotted here are some exercises. We're going to actually come back and, and touch on some of those exercises either at the end of the class today uh, or um, during the lab session rather than, rather than do them um, in tandem. So again, if anybody has any questions as we move through, please ask them. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on into the next item we're going to cover, which is do call. So do call uh, is a function. Um, that constructs and executes a function call um, either from a name or a list of arguments that are passed to it. Um, so what I mean by that is the arguments for that function are taken from an object that's a mode of list. And a nice example or a simple example is to use um, the application of rbind um, within a do call list to bind together into one large data set, a bunch of different items. So in order to do that, let's, what we're gonna do first is we're gonna set up some, uh, a, a dummy data frame for us to work with. So let's go ahead and run some commands here that we can uh, set up a, a, a dummy data frame here for my example. So in this data frame, what we're doing is here, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna generate some ages, AUCs, and we're going to generate trials. We're going to generate quite a bit of them here now. In this case, we're going to generate 10,000 um, ages, 10,000 AUCs, and um, 100 trials, basically, with 100 rows in each trial. And then we're going to set up some age bins based upon those uh, ages that are generated. Um, either one, two, three, or four, depending upon um, the age range that it's grabbed. So less than four is one, greater than four to less than six is two, and so on. And so you'll end up with having four different bins. So let's go ahead and generate this data frame. And if we take a look at the very first six rows or so, what we can see is we have ages, AUCs, we have trial, and if we wanted to demonstrate that we were, we got the right, it did what we wanted, we could say something like a unique trial. And we should see 100 of them, 100 unique numbers, because we generated um, 100 from one to 100. And then we have our bins that are associated with our ages. So if you were um, anything greater than nine should all be bin four. So all these first four, for example, are bin four. Um, things that are greater than six but less than nine are bin three and so on. And if we wanted to know how many is in each bin, we could do something like this. We could do table. Remember that from back in the early, one of the early lectures. In this case now, what it's gonna do is it's gonna tell us the number of observations in each age bin. So we have somewhere on the neighborhood of, you know, 2,000 to about 3,000 observations in each age bin. Okay, so now let's do, let's do some statistics on these uh, age bins. Maybe the first thing we want to calculate, um, in this case, we're going to use the aggregate function, something again that we saw earlier on. We're going to aggregate um, across trial and age bin. And the item we're going to aggregate across is AUC. And we're going to go ahead and calculate the median. So we'll go ahead and do that. And if we wanted to look at what was contained in SAUC, it's going to be 100 median values, sorry, I mean this, sorry to go up there so fast, I should just do a head on that instead of showing you the whole thing. But basically we have trial in the first one, age bin in the second, and then what the median AUC was. So now we have for each age bin in trial, we have a, uh, an AUC, a median AUC. Um, we could also do a similar thing. We could use T apply. 
In this case, now what we're going to calculate, um, we're going to now we're going to calculate yet another set of statistics. So we're going to say, okay, across those X's um, and those age bins. So now we're going to summarize uh, across the age bins, and we're going to say, give me the quantiles. So give me the the two and a half. 50th and 97.5th quantiles of this AUC across trials by age bin. So now if we do that, let's take a quick, now what we see is we have uh, for each age bin, because we only have four, we have a two and a half, a 50th and 97.5th um, percentile. So these are, this is the percentile across for each category, each age bin um, across each of the trials. So now what do we want to do? Well, this is very nice, but it, this isn't such a great easy thing to work with. If we want to say, <clears throat> maybe we want to do something with uh, these like this SACQ, like we want to table it out. Um, so what we could do is, we could do something like this. We're gonna say, okay, use the function, evaluate the function R bind across SACQ, and what does it end up giving us? Well, let's take a quick look. It gives us now a very nice, um, nicely organized data frame that now we could maybe write out using write table or maybe some kind of LaTeX code um, to generate out. Now we have our uh, age bins in the first, say the row names, and then we have the 50th, two and a half, and 97.5th percentiles. So this is, gives us a very nice way now of, of taking this kind of unruly SACQ, SAUCQ, and combining it into something that's much easier to deal with. So again, in this case, now we bound together, we, we very nicely bound something together. Now, another example might be uh, the use of do call um, following something like split. So we're gonna go ahead and, and uh, use the prob1.tab data that I provided to you. Let's uh, read that in. Remember, I've supplied all this R code to you all, so you can take a look at this in your leisure. So I can read in um, prob1.tab, which it didn't do, so now I've got to figure out why that might be, which sometimes happens. Let's see where we're working from here. Okay, so my working directory is home bill k. prob1.tab doesn't exist there. So what I'm gonna do is set my working directory to where, I, where it should be. So I'm gonna set it to the advanced exercises directory. And if we say get working directory, now we'll see that it's the correct place. And I should now be able to read in prob1 because it exists in that directory. And prob1 was read in, and if I wanted to take a look at it, I can now see uh, prob one. We've seen this data set before. I believe we've used it. In, it's a data set for non-mem. Ca ca carry certain non-mem characteristics associated with it. Amounts, introduced interval, ADDL, some dependent variable. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna split this data frame by ID. So we're gonna go ahead and do something like this. We're gonna use the function split, and what it ends up giving us Oops, I've gotta call it the right thing here. So now what, what it did was, it took, for each individual, it split the data frame into different lists. So now what I've got back now is I have list number one is all the individual one, list number two is individual two. It's a data frame containing a bunch of lists. Now, you might wanna do something to that list. Um, 
maybe you want to calculate uh, some characteristic. Maybe you want to calculate, say, uh, the median dependent variable across that each of those lists, each of those items. So now we have them in a, um, they're split up by ID. They are lists, so we could use something like lapply and a function that we would write to calculate the median dependent variable for each individual. There's, again, there's probably numerous ways you can do this, but we'll go ahead and let me throw up a function here to show you what we could, one way that we could do it. Okay, so now what I'm doing is here, I'm writing um, a function and I'm gonna use lapply. So I'm gonna apply the function called df and I'm writing this function on the fly. And all the df is gonna do, it's gonna calculate a new variable, which is the median of the dv values. And it's gonna ignore any ones where um, there's a missing value so he doesn't throw off our, our calculation. And it's gonna return that data frame. And what, what it's gonna operate on, because it's lapply and because this is a, a, data, a data frame containing lists, it's gonna apply this function across each individual list. So for list number one, it's gonna calculate the median DV and create a new variable for list number two. So let's go ahead and read this function in. So this function is now called res. Actually, I shouldn't say that. It's, it's, the function isn't called res, the actual result calls res because what I did was I L applied my bare function or function over prob1.ind. So now let's take a quick look at the very first lit element in res. If we look at the very first element in res, what you'll notice is the first element in res is pretty much the same first element that we saw in prob1.ind, but now what we have is we have this new um, median dependent variable calculation in there. We could do the same thing and look at two. Two would be um, the second individual. So res really consists of a set of lists, one per individual. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and use do call to bind those back together again. So we might do something like the following. We're gonna go ahead and execute our bind across each of the elements in res to bind them all together to a frame called, a new data frame called prob2. So if we do that, and let's say we do a head on prob2, now what we see is, um, or we could do something like unique prob2 dollar sign ID. We can see that if I spell it right, we now have all of our IDs back again. And what we now have is we have a new data frame where we calculated within each individual what the median DV was um, and apply that to the data frame, and so now we have a new column. And you know, there's probably, again, there's, uh, uh, there's probably a myriad of ways you could do this uh, calculation. This is just one example of how you might do it um, and incorporate um, split, incorporate, I'm sorry, split and do call. Okay. Now, so I think, in, I think in some of the examples, the test are the uh, uh, labs, I'm gonna ask you to do things in different ways. So for now, let's go ahead and move on. Um, what we've seen so far today, we've demonstrated the um, if else, saw how if is different, if and else are different than the if else function. Now let's take a look at um, the usage of all and any. Um, and, and this time, you can think of all and any are ways to test um, are ways to test a given vector against maybe one vector against another vector, uh, maybe from two different data frames um, to, to, to return a result. So let's go for example, rather than um, 
sometimes it's easier to, to actually uh, show what it's about here. So in the case of um, all, all returns true if all of the values in X are true and false if at least one of the values in X are false. So what if I said something like all prob to dollar sign ID equal one. Okay, kind of a silly one because I know that's not the case, but in this case I'm saying, well, are all the, all the IDs in prob to equal to one? Of course they're not, that's false. Um, so it returns, there may be one of them that are true. In fact, I know that at least one are true but it's gonna return the false value because they're not all true. Now, any returns true if at least one is true and false if all the values are false. So for example, let's say we did the same command and we said, are any of prob two IDs equal to one? And in that case, it's gonna give us back the result of true because there's at least one that's true. Now you can obviously see where, um, you can start to begin to see, I think, where we might want to, uh, how we could use some of these values. So let's, one of the things, if you remember from in my little function call up here, I said na.rm equals true. And I don't remember actually what's um, in that dv column, but one thing we could do is something like this, any is na, prob one dollar sign dv. So I'm saying are any of the, are there any dv values that are na? And in fact, it returns false because there are no na dv values. There are no values in um, dv that are na. So one other thing we could do, let's say that we, uh, well, let's read problem one back in again, um, just to make sure I don't remember what we, we don't think we did anything to problem one. We'll go ahead and read it back in again. And now we see we have this nice column back to the problem one data set. Now, one of the things that um, when you're doing um, data set prep or preparing data sets for non-MEM, you wanna make sure that you don't have a value for the dependent variable in a dosing row. So wherever you have an amount that's greater than zero, you surely don't want um, dv to be greater than zero. So you could do a test for that. You could say any prob one amount. And we're gonna say, okay, well, when I wanna look at prob one amount, but I really only wanna look at it when dv is greater than zero. And I want to say, well, are there any places where the amount is equal to zero when prob one is dv is greater than zero? And the result should be uh, true. Because in that case, in all cases where amount is equal to zero, dv is greater than zero. So we, we what I, the way I talked about it, I kind of said it in a little reverse fashion there, but basically we're doing the same thing here. What we wanted to test was to make sure that we didn't have any values for uh, positive amount values in the case where um, dvs were also greater than zero. The other thing we could do is here, let's say that we, um, let's say that we have two different data frames. So in this case, in fact, we do. We have a data frame called prob1, and we have a data frame, data frame called prob2. So um, let's say that we wanted to, we had something in one of the two data frames that we wanted to copy over to the other data frame. So let, let's, let's do some setup here first so we, we have something to talk about here. So let's say that we have, we have prob1. We already have prob1, so we're gonna, we're gonna call prob2 it's going to be a copy of prob1. Okay, so now I know that um, prob2 and prob1 are, are unique copies. They wouldn't necessarily have to be, but in this case they are. And let's say that in prob2 we have a variable, 
and why don't we call it, uh, we'll call it systolic blood pressure. We'll generate it. And you have to suspend your disbelief here because um, what you can envision is, let's say that you've read in two different data frames, one called prob one, one's called prob two. And prob two has this new variable in it called systolic blood pressure. And you think, wow, you know what? I really want to get that information over to prob one. I want to get the systemic blood pressure column over to prob one, but I'm, I'm kind of lazy. So I, rather than doing it programmatically in a very, uh, make very nice way to make sure that um, all the IDs are equal and that we, because even though these are the same length, right, you can envision that there might be situations where your data frames might be the same length, so the same number of rows, but something about them may be different. Maybe has, maybe one has a few more IDs and still a few less observations. So if you were to copy, say, that systolic blood pressure from one data frame to the, over to the next, things wouldn't always work out. So let's say that before we do that, we wanna make, we wanna run a few tests. So we're gonna say, well, you know what I know, first thing I wanna know is, let's make sure that all the IDs in prob one are equal to all the IDs in prob two by row. And if we do that, ah, look, it's true. And now you say, well, you know what, I know that, that even a more, fine grain one would be time. If all the times are true and all the IDs are true, then I can be comfortable that um, all the rows are gonna be just about equal. So they're all true. So now what I can do is, now that I've tested that to make sure using my all statement, I can do something just like this, very simple. I'm gonna copy the SBP column from prob two to prob one because I know from the use of those all commands and, and from some underlying knowledge of the data sets that they're the same. You know, and you might, you might do this, uh, maybe you get a variable, you get two different data sets from somebody that in one variable contains one and one variable contain, doesn't contain that variable, but you wanna move it across. You might run some of these all tests um, to, to move it across. There's probably other, there's other ways as, as you can imagine within R to make this, to test this, and to see whether or not this is true, this just happens to be one way to, to go about doing it. So, the other thing now we can do is we can kind of, since we know that um, all or any, the, 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 what you get back from all or any is a length one logical vector. So what, what, what function do we know needs or expects a length one logical vector? The if function does. So we can use a, uh, we can build in that test, that uh, all or any test inside of a function and kind of redo our creatinine clearance calculation. So let's go ahead and uh, let's reset up a, let's reset up our, our data frame that has to do with age, weight, and creatinine clearance. So now we, we're back to this data frame that has age, weight, sex, and serum creatinine. And we have our, we have our function that we saw before in fact, I think it's still out there. Let's just see, creatinine clearance X. We still have our function that calculates um, creatinine clearance based upon age, weight, and sex. So now, we could do something like this. And in fact, there's a problem here. Um, and the problem comes about because in this case, uh, not all the values are numeric. It's telling me that serum creatinine is a factor. It's not, it wasn't written in as a numeric. So we can get around that by generating a new function. Let me, gener let me pull that function up there on the screen to calculate creatinine clearance. So 
So now here's another, let me just space some of these out. So now here's another um, function here. So what this function does is, first what it does is, same creatinine clearance function, takes age, weight, and serum creatinine, but it runs a test. So first what it tests for to see if any of the variables, age, weight, or serum creatinine, are not numeric. That bang is numeric, we'll test age, then there's an or operator, or weight, or serum creatinine, and if they're not numeric, stop, give me a message that says that it's not numeric. So if we run that creatinine clearance function, It basically says, oh, you know what? I can't do that. I can't, I can't calculate creatinine clearance because some of those values are uh, not numeric. And so maybe I want to do, okay, well, you know what? Let, how do I know what's not numeric? Well, I can do something called STR or structure on my age. And I, hopefully, and Tim hasn't shown you this yet. Um, this is the thing you can look at data frames with or really any object, and it'll tell you well, look, age, weight, and sex are numeric. Oh, but look, serum creatinine was brought in as a factor with 61 levels. Well, clearly that's not going to work in my calculations. So I have to convert that to a numeric first. So let's go ahead and we'll convert that to a numeric first. So now we've converted serum creatinine to numeric, and now we'll go ahead and run the... Um, calculation. And there you go. There's our creatinine clearances. And now, of course, because we had some NAs, which it did tell us there were some NA values, um, it went ahead and didn't do the calculation for creatinine clearance. So in this case, um, what I really wanted to show you here is this is a way of building in um, these, this any function inside of something else to test uh, to do some tests first before you run a function. And, you know, and one might argue and say, well, this function doesn't take that long and it's not a big deal. And, you know, I can always go back if I get that error message and, and, uh, and uh, figure out where it occurred or why I didn't get the results I wanted. And that's true, but, but this is just an example. There may be other functions where you want to do a bunch of tests first before you implement code throughout the rest of the function because maybe that function takes a long time. Maybe it's a uh, function that's going to do um, uh, clinical trial simulation and that you have to have certain types of variables being fed in and you have to have certain variables present or it goes through a bunch of calculations and then five or six hours later you realize that one of them wasn't right but it didn't get to that till later on in the function, didn't get to that kind of argument down there. So this is just a way of a, a really good programming practice to if you know that you want certain characteristics for given variables, you can test for them early on in the function and then stop and output some kind of a message. This is especially important if uh, um, the function isn't going to be used by you. Maybe you're writing a function that somebody else is going to be using or somebody else is going to be running. It's very helpful to put in these kinds of messages, error trapping or warnings. Okay, so the last topic we're going to cover today, I'm going to, I'm going to skip over just for a minute. Um, is looking at um, the GUIs because I want to just I want to just uh, remind everybody of the homework um, for this Friday. So for this Friday, what I'd like you to do is um, do the exercises that are listed in the sections. So I think there's uh, ten point three one, ten point three two, where you have to operate on that TH data frame. And then another way to calculate creatinine clearance uh, with if else, and I've kind of alluded to that um, in 10.41, uh, you're going to read in a data frame called data5.csv. And in fact, I will post that as soon as class is over. I realize you don't, you probably don't have that in your, uh, in your, um, for this particular chapter data5.csv and test1.csv. I'll post in the next few minutes after class up to the website so you have them. 
and then you'll operate using do call on, on those. And then finally for um, the other additional homework, uh, you're going to use a built-in data frame called Indometh. Um, create a new variable um, and then do some work on bit on creating a bin for that variable. Uh, and then in this case, then for the second part of that, I'd like you to do the same thing above, but demonstrate the use of split and do call. And then finally, um, demonstrate the use of do call to make a call to XY plot using any data of your choosing. Um, and I said, do call really expects exactly two arguments, a named function and a list of, and an associated list. Um, so you really, for this exercise, you'll need to create a list of the arguments to be used by xyplot. And you've all used xyplot before um, in this class. So and we'll, we'll go over those on Friday in the lab, um, all the exercises and the homework. So just as kind of a uh, uh, nice to know piece here, the last thing we're going to cover is really is just a little bit about the graphical user interfaces in our uh, R, like most software and languages, was really available only from the command line. Um, this few is probably, well, it's probably further back now, probably eight or nine years ago. Um, but since then, lots of GUI or GUI-like interfaces have, have become available. Uh, the nice benefits of a true GUI, um, I think what you'll find, if for those of you who might have used S Plus in the past, you can generate plots with a very nice graphical user interface. You can do a bunch of point and clicks to generate plots. But the, the, the key really is being able to, to reproduce those plots. And then you can capture the code that generates those plots. But very quickly, as you, as you become skilled in um, using R, you don't really need a, a true kind of point and click interface. You just need some interface that gives you some uh, access to the command line or to a kind of an easier set a way of, of executing command line arguments. So that's kind of where R has built its um, niche, so to speak, here. So, you know, if you, if you use R for Windows, um, you know, that offers a very nice uh, interface to the R command line. You can submit pieces of code. You can submit um, blocks of code. Um, you can install packages very nicely. It gives you nice graphical pop-up windows. But also you'll realize quickly, and this could have changed actually. I haven't used the R windows in a while, but for a while there, there was no syntax highlighting. And there's really limited ability to customize that, um, that interface at all. Um, for those of you who use a Mac, I think uh, you'll, you'll find the Mac interface is, I think, I think better. Um, early on, it's been providing, say, syntax highlighting, uh, does very nicely for installing packages, but again, um, very limited ability or no ability to add or customize features. Um, and then we kind of come to the interface you're currently using, um, the RStudio interface, which is available both as a Mac, Windows OX, or Linux as a standalone, um, and some of you may have downloaded that to use that. Um, or you could obviously use it the way we do, which is in a client-server version. Um, unlike the other install R interfaces that come with it, you have to download it from the web, but it is freely available. Um, it has a nice little window for viewing plots. Uh, the, the benefit that we see in that, it offers a client-server version um, like we use now that can be run as a web browser. Um, the only real drawback is, is uh, there are some browsers that don't work so well with the client server version. I think there might be some versions of Microsoft um, browser that don't work so well. Um, and then I guess an interface I used to tout very highly um, before RStudio came around was, was the use of Emacs. And, and the plugin ESS interface for it, and I still use it. It's a very nice uh, interface to the R command line um, on Windows and Mac OS and the Linux GUI. It is there is graphical point and click mode. Um, we used to use it very much over a text-based connection. Uh, I call it the Swiss Army knife because it's highly customizable. Uh, you can you can tweak it till your heart's content. 
Uh, it also does lots of other things too. It, so it's kind of a one-stop shop for programming environments, things like C++, R, SAS, WinBugs. You can run all of those from within that um, Emacs interface. You know, the downside of it is, is there is a, there's a bit of a learning curve um, and it can be fairly high if you're using something like Emacs and ESS over a uh, text-based connection like SSH. Um, if you're using it in a GUI, it's not so bad. The point-and-click mode to open up files, you still, you still have to write your R code and as, as code, but I, again, I think it's a it's pretty reasonable interface. Um, and if you want some more reading about those interfaces, you can go ahead and look on the uh, SciViews link here that we provided for the R GUI. Um, Okay, so just to, to finalize it, I guess today then, um, do the exercises and the homework for the lab. And uh, just as again, for those of you, if anybody walked in late, as a reminder, um, we will be taking the modeling outside of our class that we missed a couple weeks ago and pushing that to one lecture from the end and then extending out the course lecture for just one week we had built an extra fluff week in there anyway from our purposes. So basically the very last lecture will go out one more week and the, uh, the date for the test, when the test is distributed, the final exam will be pushed out by one week as well. So you'll have um, the project and everything will still stay due the same time it was due before. So that, that won't change. Um, the project date, the due date will still, change, still stay the same. It's just that you'll have one extra week of classes. It's really not an extra week. It's just one longer week for the week that we missed. Okay, um, that's it for today. I will go ahead and post those two data sets that I promised um, in the next, say, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, the information for the project, uh, you, well, you actually should have been given out to you. I'll, I'll, let me take, let me confer with the other instructors and see actually where that, uh, where that, project information lies to make sure that that's disseminated out. Um, I, I believe it would have been gone over in one of the other lectures that we had, but I'll verify that and uh, we'll, we'll, I'll post a note um, before Friday's class to where you can find the information on the project. Um, okay, then I, I guess that's it for today. Let's see. Uh, Great, I guess that's it for today. Then I will see everybody again on Friday for lab and we'll go over the exercises and the homework. Thanks a lot.